Now there's all sorts of um, things that show up here once you start looking at it. And, and for example, aluminium, uh, the boron and the fluoride we saw is active and necessary to activate this uh, silica here. And, and if we look at a plant process, then if we, if we actually get the uh, fluoride and boron, that activates the silica, which as we know with using 501 will activate the phosphorus, which can kick the aluminium into gear, which can kick this, this uh, uh, magnesium sulfate into gear for photosynthesis, which can then kick this uh, salt activity of uh, sodium chloride into activity. So that, you know, that's how the circle becomes activated, as it were. So we start to see that these guys, when they're in opposition, tend to activate each other. So sodium phosphate is a really wonderful thing for uh, stimulating biochemical digestion. So if you've got a lot of lactic acid that will cause gout, if you use sodium phosphate, it'll actually break that down into carbonic acid and water. So it actually makes water, and from what I can tell, you sort of burp out the carbonic acid. And so these guys really sort of activate the digestion, basically. So if you've ever got a slow digestion, that'll give it a good kick along. Um, and, uh, and so on. The interesting thing that happens this way, there's a few little stories. This, the the uh, nitrate, the, the boron and the nitrate apparently have exactly the same crystal structure as carbon. And so does the aluminium phosphate, that they are exactly the same crystal structure as silica. And so we sort of, you know, get a lot of stability out of these sort of relationships. But lithium nitrate is what they're using for bipolar people because it activates and liberates. So we've got this, this sort of stability of elements and activation of elements that becomes obvious in this uh, ring as well. So the point of, we can start to look at this. How can we work with plants with this? And. Um, I just had a quick thought about this, and it was one of those games that I was going to play, you know, if we had plenty of time to do that, was, you know, how do we look at these different parts of the plant in regards to these elements here? And so this is how I sort of came up with that in relationship to these cosmic forces, earthly matter, and so forth. So what this reference does is it says we've got that sort of understanding of how those processes are working in the plant. So how much is phosphorus used to build good tap roots? And we know that it does build good roots, phosphorus. Um, and the same, you know, aluminium is the element that's really stood out for me in this. You know, I haven't really taken aluminium seriously at all. It's just there and we don't really care about it much. But it's really given a whole new sort of, you know, there's a big finger pointing at aluminium going, what's happening in there, you know? How can we use aluminium more consciously in our processes? And it's, it's obviously a very earthing element in, in the periodic table. It, it's in that world physical element. So it's a very earthing bringing onto the planet. And it's a cell cell, so it's the most crystallized, you know? So it's, it's an element that, that, you know, we need to be more aware of. Uh, you know, we just say lime. How much are we actually saying aluminium when we say lime in the context of the agriculture course? You know. There's an awful lot of phosphorus tied up on aluminium yeah. in our agricultural sphere. Yeah. And it's locked away and some of it can be released by silica. Yeah. But, uh, how else? Can we get some of that phosphorus back if we need it? How can we regulate this? They're, they're classically, classic brookside, you add calcium, lift up your pH, and at a certain point the aluminium locks up and the phosphorus becomes available. You know, because it is a low pH um, 
active element, you know, being a heavy metal, you need a bit of acid there to make it run to lock up your phosphorus. So that's the, the classic way of doing that. Um, I think you could start to have a look at uh, that aluminium chloride that my, um, well, I think from what I can see is that if you want more phosphorus from homeopathics, you actually add it as sodium phosphate, aluminium phosphate, magnesium phosphate. You use that as the actual homeopathic to stimulate the phosphorus. And I'd be inclined to look at the sodium phosphate because that's the most active uh, relationship. Like the aluminium phosphate works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. Uh, it, it does have a very incarnating uh, wake up uh, thing and I've, and I've liked taking it. Uh, it's helped me actually clarify my intuitions quite a lot. So it's like it's brought me into my physical body a bit more so that I can actually make that connection that much clearer. So that's how I've seen the aluminium work. Um, but in an agricultural sense, I would look at that, magnesium phosphate and sodium phosphate as ways to activate the phosphate processes around. Because if you've got too much sulfur or too much chlorine, it's going to knock the phosphate out. So you've got to watch your chlorine. And, you know, we, we use town supply water in our garden, so we've got a lot of chlorine in our water. And I can see it in the plants. You know, they get very small, they get a very light green. You know, so I make sure that I sort of beef up the sulphur and the phosphorus to keep pushing the chlorine back because the chlorine knocks them out. And so, so it's, you know, if you want more phosphorus, make sure you don't have too much chlorine is, is really the message. If you've got too much phosphorus, try a bit of chlorine. <laughs> 